All right, welcome back to our Sunday evening service at Bible Baptist Church. I want to make just a few announcements. Our Obviously, our Easter dinner that was scheduled for today has been canceled, but we do plan to do that at a later date, and as soon as we set a date, we'll let you know when that is. As of right now, uh, we plan to do uh, Sunday morning services like we did this morning in the parking lot, and then Sunday evening services tonight, and then Wednesday evening services online only. Uh, and uh, our ladies' tea that was scheduled for uh, April the 19th, we've, uh, we've pushed that off a little bit, but we will, uh, we plan to do that also at a later date. All right, tonight, uh, myself and my wife, We'll be doing the special music, and Miss Rebecca's playing the piano for us. Thank you. Hope you enjoy. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed the special music. Uh, we're going to be preaching from 2 Kings chapter 22 tonight. We're continuing our thought on the split kingdom, and we've made it to Josiah. And actually, last week we talked a little bit about uh, Ammon and Manasseh 
and Hezekiah, and we got up to Josiah, and we started to talk about what uh, uh, caused his reform and his restoration of um, the temple, and it was uh, finding the Word of God. Uh, and uh, had to stop there and ran out of time, but uh, we're going to pick it up there and uh, look at uh, uh, the Word of God and how important the Word of God is, especially in a time like this. Uh, this book is very important to us, uh, and it will change a family, it will change a church, it will change a nation. And uh, let me say before I read this, I hope that uh, to our church, I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, we've, we've taken Romans 15:4. And we found that uh, these things that were written aforetime were written for our learning, for our admonition. These people are in samples for us. And so uh, I, I hope that we can learn from uh, not only the mistakes of people like Ahab and, and Ammon and, and Manasseh, the way he lived his life, even though he repented late in life, and, and the victories that Josiah had. I, I hope that we can learn not just from the bad things, but the good things that they've done here. Uh, so hope it's been a blessing to you. I want to read quite a bit here in uh, 2 Kings chapter 22. Let's start in verse 1. The Bible says Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 30 and one years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jedida. We talked a little bit about her last time, the daughter of Adaya of Bosgath. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the way of David his father and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. So I think we said last time that Josiah was a miracle in that uh, he had a very wicked daddy in uh, Ammon, and, uh, but for whatever reason, we, we attribute it to his mother, uh, very similar to uh, what happened with Timothy with his uh, mom and his grandmother, uh, teaching him the Word of God. And uh, so we think that she made a difference uh, in his life. Verse 3 says, And it came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah that the king sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshulam, the scribe, to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkiah, the high priest, that he may sum the silver which is brought into the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the door have gathered of the people, and let them deliver it into the hand of the doers of the work that have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And let them give it to the doers of the work which is in the house of the Lord to repair the breaches of the house." unto carpenters unto, and builders and masons and to buy timber and hewn stone to repair the house. Howbeit there was no reckoning made with them of the money that was delivered into their hand because they dealt faithfully. And Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan and he read it. And Shaphan the scribe came to the king and brought the king word again and said, Thy servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of them that do the work that have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath delivered me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. <clears throat> and it came to pass, when the king had heard the words of the book of the law, that he rent his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest and Ahikam the son of Shaphan, and Akbor the son of Micaiah, and Shaphan the scribe, and Asahiah the servant of the kings, saying, Go ye inquire of the Lord for me, and for the people, and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book, to do according unto all that which is written in, uh, concerning us. So Hilkiah the priest, and Ahikam, and Akbor, and Shaphan, and Asahiah went unto Huldah the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikvah, the son of Harhas, king or keeper of the wardrobe. Now she dwelt in Jerusalem in the college, and they communed with her. And she said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Tell the man that sent you to me, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the words of this book or of the book which the king of Judah hath read. Because they have forsaken me, and have burned incense unto other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore my wrath shall be kindled against this place, and shall not be quenched. 
But to the king of Judah, which sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall you say to him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, as touching the words which thou hast heard, because thine heart was tender, and thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord, when thou heardest what I spake against this place and against the inhabitants thereof, that they should become a desolation and a curse, and hast rent thy clothes and wept before me, I also have heard thee, saith the Lord. Behold, therefore, I will gather thee unto thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered into the, thy grave in peace, and thine eyes shall not see all the evil which I will bring upon this place. And they brought the king word again. Now, I know I read a lot there. And uh, I got a, a, you know, read the whole chapter there, but I want that to be fresh in your mind. I think we all agree that uh, the difference that was made here, not only in, in a man, in a king, in his heart, and in the scribe, and Shaphan, and the people that, that found uh, the book of the law, but because it made a difference in one man's heart, it made a difference in an entire kingdom. Um, I'm convinced that if churches, if our nation... If families really, really take hold of this book and start to believe this book and look at it again and try to uh, adhere to its commandments, its precepts, it line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, I'm convinced that it will make a difference in a family and in a nation and in a church. And just a few things here. Uh, that I think is worth noting. First of all, there was an interest in the church house in the first part of this uh, chapter. If you look at verses 3, really verses 3 through 7, what you find is that it came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah that the king sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshulam the scribe, to the house of the Lord, saying. And then he says, we need to find out why... Uh, this is torn down. We need to make sure that the carpenters and all the other people that are mentioned later on in the passage are, are being taken care of. We never want to defraud people that are taking care of the house of the Lord. Um, I know that in the New Testament, the house of the Lord is our body. I understand that. But we meet here. This is where this is home base for us. We send missionaries out of here. We have church services here. We had a church service in the parking lot this morning, but it's still on the grounds. But we never want to defraud people. They come and do work here. People come and clean the church. They do work on the church. They take care of this, that, and the other. We want to take care of them. And that's what the king is trying to do here. But the good thing about the passage is it starts off with there being an interest in the house of the Lord. Now, I know in the New Testament, again, like I said, this, I, the, this is the temple of the Holy Ghost. This is where He dwells. There should be, among saved people, more of an interest to take care of their bodies. Bodily exercise profiteth little. I get that. We should want to live for a long time because we want to serve the Lord for a long time. But this place, even though we don't technically, biblically call it the house of the Lord, this is where we meet. And there needs to be an interest in church again. Um, we've had uh, we've not had a national revival since uh, probably uh, the 1920s, 1930s. We've had pockets of revival. Uh, and from the 1920s and 30s until now, there's been more and more apathy concerning the church, more and more of a disinterest in church. On Sunday, Americans aren't in church. Uh, on Sunday, Americans are on golf courses and, and watching football and, and watching uh, other shows leading up to football games and, and baseball and basketball and they're playing youth league tournaments and they're at the lake and they're, they're doing different things on Sunday now. I promise you, if you take an interest in a Bible-believing church, it will make a difference in your family. And here, someone took interest in the house of God and it made a difference in an entire nation. The king takes an interest in the church. Um, our leaders need to take an interest in, in, our, in our churches. There was a day and age when our leaders allowed a Bible-believing pulpit to affect their decisions that they made through the course of the week that would affect or drastically affect our nation. Um, I know I'm going to give you a little bit of a negative spin here, but I think it's good for you to hear that from time to time. Um, 
Our, most of our uh, Bible-believing churches and even some of these other institutions and organizations have been uh, waving the flag for uh, Donald Trump and Mike Pence now for four years, and now we're coming up on an election year. Listen, I think God uh, directs the heart of the king. I think God put puts people in certain places, sometimes wicked kings, sometimes kings like Cyrus that are not necessarily followers of God, but they help the people of God. And so we have to be balanced on how we look at that. I still, I still don't think that our leaders have taken enough interest in Bible-believing churches. I don't think they've taken enough of a stand there. Uh, and I'm, I, I, get, uh, I get sort of tired of hearing the, uh, the flag wavers that say that uh, uh, Donald Trump and Mike Pence are going to save our nation and we're so glad they're in and God put them in and now they're going to do this and we have to maintain our nation at all costs. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I think we have to stick up for and adhere to and preach the Word of God at all costs. I think we have to please God at all costs. Um, what about Mike Pence? Uh, I hate to throw stones, but, but why, why can't we just find out the truth about somebody? Uh, Mike Pence was raised an Irish Catholic and his family revered the Kennedy family. Now, if that's not an alarm for you in the first place, I don't know what is. Uh, you want to take a good study of the Kennedy family, what you'll find is a family that made their money off Seagram, Seagram 7 liquor, alcohol. And there's murder has followed that family and scandal and booze and everything else. So already, I don't think that's a good idea. I, uh, I smell a rat. Um, in the 1990s, by his own admission, Mike Pence attended Grace Evangelical Church, which, which is a, a mega church, a very large non-denominational church. But he says by 2013, his family was looking for a church. You show me a man that can't find a church in about a decade, I'll show you somebody's backslidden. There's something wrong there. Uh, you can find a Bible-believing church to attend. You're not going to agree with everything. Who does? We don't, we're not all going to get along with each other. But you can find a church that promotes the Word of God and attend that church faithfully, pray for the people in that church, and be faithful to that church. Um, he's against same-sex marriage. Well, who isn't? Anybody with a half a brain can tell that that's, there's, there's something wrong with that. You should be against that. There are lost people that are against that. Um, he's against stem cell research. I don't think those are reasons that we, we need to wave the flag for him. Uh, there, there are a lot of um, moral people who don't profess Christianity who are against those same things. Mike Pence fought with Donald Trump when Trump wanted to ban all Muslims from coming into the United States of America. So at one point before they joined forces, they didn't agree with each other on, on every issue, and that's okay, but uh, Donald Trump saw that um, there was a certain group of people, all terrorists are uh, affiliated with one religion, by the way, all terrorists. I don't care what the news media tells you. So uh, Donald Trump said that he, he felt like terrorists were attached to the, the Muslim religion and he did not want them in our country because they're a detriment to our country. They're, uh, they would be a, uh, a scare for our country. Uh, there, there's, uh, there's warning flags that go up there. And then Mike Pence disagreed with him on that. Mike Pence signed any, he was the governor of Indiana, so he signed Indiana's, quote, Religious Freedom Act, and then, and then within just a few days had to revise that because major corporations and organizations and even celebrities vowed to boycott Indiana. So uh, there, there are some alarms. There's some, there's some signals there that, that concern me. Um, if, uh, if you take a stand and take a stand on the Word of God, it doesn't matter what people say about it. You stick with your guns. And he signed a Religious Freedom Act, and then once everybody started boycotting and he thought that it was going to cost the state of Indiana some money, he signed in a revised Religious Freedom Act that changed some of those things within just a few days. Um, so I, I hate to be that way, but I get sick of hearing people, um, dear God, they sound like Abraham Lincoln, you know, we have to maintain the union at all costs. Uh, and, and what's important is keeping our nation together and, and keeping this and that and the other. No, what's important is sticking to the Word of God 
and and calling a spade a spade and saying if it's right it's right do it and and don't look back and if it's wrong quit it and if you can't quit don't kick me kick yourself but if it's wrong say it's wrong say it out loud our leaders need to step up to the plate and support verbally bible believing churches again and and when they do that then there's a chance of us seeing at least pockets of revival number two we saw in verse eight that the book is found the law is found and what they probably found here was uh, genesis exodus numbers leviticus deuteronomy uh, so what they found here were the first five books of our bible um, now you'll notice that starting in verse 8, twice the book is mentioned. You look down at verse 13, it's mentioned. Verse 11, it's mentioned. Uh, verse 13, it's mentioned actually twice. And then you go on up to verse 16, and it's mentioned again. Seven times in the passage, the book is mentioned. Okay? So what is that? Well, it's completion. Seven is a number of completion. If you have a King James Bible, you have a book that uh, the old covers had uh, seven places back here on the spine on the binding. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, because it's a complete book, okay? The next time you find that, you find that in Revelation chapter 22, all the way to the end of the book, and then verse 7 says this book, and then verse 9 says this book, verse 10 says this book, and then you have two times in verse 18, and two times in verse 19 where you find the book is mentioned. So seven times again, it's completion. So uh, this book is complete, and all the emphasis here is on a completed Word of God that if adhered to will uh, help a nation, help a family, help a church. Now, number three, the law is taken here to the political leaders, and it's read out loud. So uh, I pray someone like uh, Awake America, one of these uh, organizations that I've just talked about earlier, I pray one of these or some of these could get in somewhere and read this book to them and pray with them and make a difference. I'm convinced that's happening on a small scale. I'm convinced we have some leaders who are saved. But I, I wish they would take a step further and take a stand for the Word of God and take a stand for our churches and, and take a stand for right and, and call right right and call wrong wrong. That's one of the uh, problems with our society is that we, uh, for whatever reason, our, the, our leaders call evil good and they call good evil. And it's very dangerous to do that. And you've, we've seen already by coming through First and Second Kings, we've already seen what it's done to the nation of Israel. And uh, we're, we're living that again. So the law is taken here to the political leaders and it's read out loud. Now, you say, well, if we do that, they're going to say this and they're going to say that and we're going to get rejected. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's the same old thing. You know, we don't, we don't knock doors in the 21st century um, because people don't want to uh, come to church. They don't want their door knocked on. They don't want to talk to. They don't want to be talked to about the Bible and Jesus Christ and, and eternity and church and all those different things. Listen, if it's right, you just do it no matter what, okay? And if you get rejection, you'll be better for it. It's okay. Um, our, our pattern um, is Paul the Apostle, the Apostle to the Gentiles, our preacher. He wrote the books that are doctrinally aimed at us. So Paul is a guy that in, on multiple occasions, I'll just give you, I'll just list two for you. Uh, in Acts chapter 24, and in Acts chapter 25, Paul preaches before political leaders of the day. One of those people, Festus and Felix, say uh, to Paul, yeah, come back and, and talk to me again about this when I have a convenient time, when there's a different season, come back. There's rejection. They didn't accept. Uh, he preached to Agrippa in Acts chapter 25, and Agrippa looked right at him in front of a crowd of people and said, Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. But he didn't persuade him. He rejected him. So just because we fear rejection in those areas doesn't mean it's not right to preach the truth and then let the chips fall where they may. Let the Lord do the work that he's going to do. Tell the truth. Tell it in front of political leaders. Tell it in front of whoever. And then let the Lord do whatever he's going to do with that. Now, 
in verse 11, conviction sets in because when the king sends these men uh, to restore and try to fix up the house of the Lord, they find the book and then they bring the book back and they read it not only in front of the political leaders, which is the king, they read it in front of the king here in verse 11. Now he responds, unlike Agrippa, he responds unlike Festus and unlike Felix, and that is when he hears it in verse 11, what does it say he does? He, he rends his clothes. And so what is that a picture of? You know, we look at that sometimes as, uh, as Europeans. We're not Asiatics. So we don't do things like that anymore. And I think sometimes we read across things like this and we think, well, he's tearing his clothes off himself, so he's angry. I think he's probably angry at himself and at his forefathers for allowing the nation to get in this debauchery and this backslidden state. But for an Asiatic, what it is, that when they do that, it's, it's a, his clothes are on his body. So it's a type of him being rent in half and his body being rent and he's, he's, he's split. He's, he's in pain because of what he's found out from the Word of God. Uh, you Bible believers, any, you've read the Word of God and you've, the Lord has dealt with you and dealt with your hearts and use some verses in here to do that, and it's pained you physically. Now, spiritually, I understand it starts that way, but because you're pained spiritually, it's even affected you physically. You've left a church service really in an agony because you know that you've been wrong and done wrong, and you've needed to repent, and you've not made that decision. Conviction sets in. He rends his clothes. It's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. In Numbers 32, verse 23, the Bible says, Be sure your sin will find you out. That passage, especially for a lost man, should shake you up. If that passage doesn't strike fear in your heart and do something to you, then there's something wrong. Save person, that passage should strike fear in your heart. Be sure your sin will find you out. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Now that passage there in Numbers 32 is to Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. And Moses looks at them and says, you told me that you're going to go over and fight the fight with us, and when we win and everything is taken care of, then you can come back on the other side of Jordan and possess the property that you've said you wanted. But if you don't do that, if you get over here and you leave us in the middle of the fight and you go back to your women and your children and all your property, then you be sure your sin will find you out. That should scare people saved or lost. It should, the conviction should set in there. Um, not only that, but you get down here in verses about 14 and 13 and 14 in that area, and you find out that, uh, especially in verse 16, that the prophetess, Huldah here, finds out what's going on, and they consult her, and she, she does what I call setting the hook. Uh, sometimes when you, you have a sinner and you, you're talking to a sinner about eternity and heaven and hell and how important it is that they trust Jesus Christ as Savior, sometimes the very worst thing you can do is just say, why don't you pray this prayer and get saved? Sometimes the best thing you can do is say to them, you know what, there's nothing you can do. You're on your way to hell. Because they're already hopefully under conviction, and that scares them even more and, and causes them to think, oh no, there's nothing I can do. But then you always follow that up with, no, there's nothing you can do, but there's something Jesus Christ did for you. He died in your place. You need to accept Him. You need to be saved. You need to be born again. There's nothing you can do. You can't live a good enough life. So Jesus Christ did. He lived a good enough life. But what she does here, when the king consults her in verse 16, she says, look at verse 16 in 2 Kings 22. Says, she says, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof. Now, she doesn't tell them that she's going to spare Josiah and his generation. She didn't, she didn't release that information yet. She says... God said He was going to do it, and that's what He's going to do. 
I'm convinced that the passage they read in front of the king here was the last part of Deuteronomy, chapters 26, 27, 28, right in that area, where God said, if you go away from me, I'll bring this curse upon you and this curse upon your children and this curse upon your land. And there's a list of curses there. But God says, if you follow me, I'll bless you. I'll bless your land. I'll bless your children. I'll do this. I'll do that. And so I'm convinced that that's the passage that was read in front of the king and he saw all the curses and he saw how his people were acting and he realized that, oh no, imminent judgment is coming. So when he comes to Hulda, she says, yes, that's exactly what's going to happen. God's going to rain down fire and brimstone and I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof. So she doesn't just give him an easy out. She doesn't just say, oh, real quick, oh, just pray this prayer and you'll be fine. So uh, I think that she sets the hook here and says judgment is coming. Now, not only that, but the sins that the, the nation has been committing are mentioned here. You notice that in uh, verses uh, 17, 18, 19, and so forth and so on. They've forsaken God. They served other gods. They provoked God by doing those things. Uh, they provoked God with the works of their hands. The, to me, the best word in the passage is the first word in verse 18. Judgment is coming. Yes, God said He'd bring evil upon you and upon this people and all these different things. And But, but, because the king paid attention to the house of God, found the Word of God, rent his clothes and was genuinely under conviction and genuinely repentant over what he heard and knew that God was a God that could do that and was good at His Word, he's, he's, God spares him and his people for at least a short time. But to the king of Judah, which sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall you say to him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, as touching the words which thou hast heard, because thine heart was tender, and thou hast humbled thyself. Because he paid attention to the Word of God, God put that judgment off. You tell the sinner, look, you can't do anything to be saved. But Christ died for you. But God commendeth His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There's a, a prescription in verse 19 for putting off that judgment. You say, what is it? It's trembling at the Word of God. Bible believers, listen to me. I love you, but I think, I think there's a good chance that a lot of Bible believers, including myself at times, have become complacent with the Word of God. We've, we've become maybe even too familiar with the Word of God. Maybe we, I know this sounds crazy, but maybe we've come to a place where we know too much about the Word of God. I know you say, how can that be? But sometimes we just sort of, just sort of take this book for granted. You know, you remember that story about Uzzah when they're transporting the ark and it's on the cart and then the oxen stumbled and he reached forward to stabilize the ark, which is a good thing. He didn't want it to fall off of the cart. But he just reached forward and stabilized that. And when he did, God made a breach upon him and smote him down dead. And whatever he did to him, it scared everybody around him. Here's the thing that, that we, f we forget about that passage. Uzzah had that ark in, his, uh, in and around his home for about 10 years. You know what happened? He just sort of became too familiar with it. Just, well, it's just an ark. It's just like everything else. And we're in and around this book and we become too familiar with it and we don't tremble at it anymore like the book of Isaiah tells us to do. We don't work out our own salvation with fear and trembling anymore like we used to. We first got saved and this book told us to do something. We were scared not to do it. And when this book told us to stop something, we were scared to do it because we were afraid that imminent judgment was just around the corner. But because judgment is not executed speedily, it's fully set in the heart of the sons of men to do evil. We think because judgment has not come yet that it's not coming. It's coming. Jacob de Shazer was a uh, raider in Japan in April of 1942. He was captured POW in Japan. He watched two of his uh, uh, fellow uh, soldiers die in front of a firing squad. He watched another one starve to death slowly, and he remembered his childhood, and he begged for a Bible, and eventually a Japanese jailer threw him a Bible and said, you have three weeks, three weeks only, 
And at three weeks in, he came and got that Bible and took it back from him. And eventually the war was over in 45, and he went back and got married and had a son. And because of three weeks with the Word of God, he got saved. And in 1948, he headed back to Japan as a missionary to the Japanese people. Listen to me. The Bible makes a difference. May God bless you tonight. Love your church. Praying for you.